Good afternoon and welcome everybody to today's Premier Advisor Live. My name is Shomi Saha. I am Premier Senior Director of Advocacy located out of our Washington DC office. And I'm really excited to invite everyone here today. So our topic today is going to be on the new USP standards for Chapter 800 as they relate to the handling of hazardous drugs. Just last month, we actually held a similar advisor live on revisions to USP Chapter 795 and 797. And as a follow-up to that advisor live, something that we heard loud and clear from our members was that a deep dive of USP 800 and helping members understand how they can become ready for um, compliance with that new chapter by December 1st was something that everybody was interested in. So here we are today. Um, so, a couple housekeeping items to go over. We are recording today's call, and you'll be able to watch the recording in about 48 hours. Those that are registered for the webinar will all receive a link with the recording, and it will also be available on premierinc.com as well in the newsroom section. We've set aside an hour for today's webinar, and we'll be leaving plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. You can submit a question at any time during the call. Um, one thing you can do is utilize the chat function in the bottom left screen to ask questions anonymously. Or once we get to the Q&A session, we'll also have the operator share how you can dial in and verbally ask a question. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. So back for round two are our USP experts. Annie Lambert, who is based out of Tacoma, Washington, is Premier's Director of Performance Partners. And Chris Jones, who is located out of Premier's headquarters in Charlotte, North Carolina, is the Director of Pharmacy Automation and Technology. Both of these individuals are pharmacists and are extremely well versed in all of the USP requirements and are here to help you get ready for compliance. So it is my pleasure to turn things over to Annie and Chris to talk through today's agenda and provide the presentation. Great, thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Shomi. And um, as, as she said, we were here just about a month ago talking about the updates to uh, 795 and 797 and um, heard lots of interest in USP 800, which has been out for a little bit wh a while, but uh, we wanna certainly meet your needs for wherever you're at on the road to compliance. Um, so we'll just do a little background on 800. Um, hopefully most of you are pretty familiar with the standards at this point. Um, talk about the road to readiness and uh, hit a, a couple of challenging scenarios that we've heard uh, and discussed with some of our members and um, maybe you have some that you wanna ask about too. Uh, and then Chris will uh, highlight some of our resources to assist with compliance, especially from our uh, contracted vendors perspective. And then um, we'll leave as much time as we can for, for Q&A. And if we can't get to all the, the questions um, on the call, we'll do our best to follow up um, on those by posting the answers, um, which I owe all of you uh, who are on our 795-797 call, I still owe you answers to your questions. So um, know that I haven't forgotten. Um, and then today, uh, I'm happy to be in my home office in Tacoma. Um, for the, the last call, I was in the car on the way to the airport. So hopefully I'll be a little bit more settled for you today. Um, here we are. Uh, these are the four USP compounding standards. Um, you're familiar with all of them. And I uh, just wanted to set that, that stage um, again, that they're, they're kind of related to each other, um, especially 795 and 797. Um, referring to 800 and, and 800 referring back to uh, those chapters as well. Uh, 825 is an area that uh, I think there's a lot of questions on too and important that it's called out separately. Um, we're not going to cover that today, um, but we do have some, some uh, interest in that in Premier as well. Um, so I just wanted to go over a little bit of the, the evolution of the hazardous drug guidelines and standards. Um, I think you all know where we're at, that the, the clock is ticking um, on our way to the implementation date of December 1st, 2019. Um, but remember that USB 800 was published in 2016, so it's been nearly three years that we have had uh, to, to review and prepare for it. And it's really a reflection of all of these other um, guidelines from professional agencies uh, across time. So back as early as the, um, the mid-80s, uh, the Oncology Nurses Society published their um, 
guidelines for recommended practices for handling of chemotherapy and biotherapy. Um, ASHP, uh, the Pharmacy Association, followed suit uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, and then OSHA, um, again, uh, right after that in the 80s. Uh, and then NIOSH issued the um, best practice uh, alert in 2004 with subsequent updates to their hazardous drug list um, in uh, later years. I'm sure we're all waiting for that update. Um, we were expected a hazardous drug list update in 2018, um, but I, I think it's coming later this year in 2019, probably close to our uh, implementation target. Um, so uh, as I said, these are not new uh, standards. Uh, the interpretation and the um, enforcement of them is what uh, we're all waiting for. So just a quick quick overview, um, what is the USP 800 um, hazardous drug chapter? It is uh, the, the safety and quality standards to minimize the risk of exposure to hazardous drugs in healthcare settings. And this is really a worker protection uh, set of standards, whereas uh, 795 and 797 are more about uh, uh, patient safety. Um, as I said, they all work together, um, but it, it's kind of important to make that distinction. Um, the USP 800 chapter defines what hazardous drugs are, pointing back to that NIOSH list, um, and it does allow for an assessment of risk uh, strategy, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, later in the presentation. Um, most of the chapter is uh, based on requirements for various uh, elements, such as facilities, storage, handling, uh, decontamination, um, all of those things. There are some other elements that are only recommended, um, so those are, are described as shoulds, in the chapter, uh, and the two key areas for that are environmental monitoring and medical surveillance. Uh, so that's something that's a little bit different than some of the other chapters where um, almost all of them are, are focused on requirements. Um, and then uh, now with the, the revised 795 and 797 coming out just last month, uh, there's, there's uh, clarity in how uh, 800 is now compendiable compendially applicable, um, that's always a mouthful, um, because it is, is listed in 795 and 797. Um, USP has, has attempted to issue some clarification about what that really means uh, in, in terms of compendial applicability, uh, and it, it looks like it's fairly focused on the 795 non-sterile compounding and the 797 sterile compounding uh, regulation, certainly 800 uh, covers a lot more besides just what happens in the pharmacy. Um, so uh, it will really be up to other regulatory and accrediting bodies to enforce uh, the different elements of, of USP 800. Uh, and that, that kind of goes to who it applies to. Uh, it's the intent of 800 is to uh, apply to all healthcare personnel who handle hazardous drugs. And that's really throughout the whole medication use process. That's whether you're in a hospital or a clinic or a private practice or an infusion center or a, you know, a nursing home or a home health agency. That's the intent. Um, whether that's who will uh, be enforced to those standards uh, is, is at the mercy of uh, state State Boards of Pharmacy and Department of Health and, and other agencies like that. Um, but what I really want to focus on is why this is important uh, to you and your teams and um, everyone is that this, there, there are many, you know, millions of healthcare workers uh, who are exposed to hazardous drugs each year and there's many uh, well-established um, risks of hazardous drug exposure, many resources and in, in fact listed on the uh, NIOSH uh, website. If you have question or concern about um, a particular drug or a particular process um, or even general impacts, um, both on the acute exposure side and the chronic exposure side, I'd really encourage you to check out um, some of those references on the NIOSH website. Um, so in general, USP 800 is really intended to, to promote worker safety, which then in turn supports patient safety because we have uh, healthy workers that are available to take care of patients. And then some of the containment uh, strategies also are intended to help protect the environment. So the three main uh, general strategies of USP 800 are preventing exposure when possible, containing it, and uh, reducing exposure as much as we can. <clears throat> 
So uh, along the way, as I said, you know, it's, this, it's been out since 2016. Um, many of you have been spending um, a little or a lot of time on the road to USP 800 readiness. And uh, so we'll talk about a few areas that um, you could have been or should be or maybe already have uh, been focusing on for compliance. And I'll try and highlight a couple of areas where I think uh, regulatory groups will be uh, checking on you. So here's, here's that road to compliance. Uh, as I said, there might be a few curves or bumps along the way as well, but um, a good place to start is the hazardous drug list. Um, have you defined your list? Have you done an assessment of risk um, approach? Uh, and we're going to go into all of these topics a little bit in more detail. Um, facilities, definitely a, a, a big, could be a big curveball, especially when it comes to expenses um, for implementing negative pressure and uh, engineering controls. Policies and procedures, there's uh, numerous ways you can implement this with um, you know, personal protective equipment, spill management, disposal, um, all those different elements. Uh, and then once you've implemented those policies and procedures, training staff on uh, how to do all of that, um, thinking about who to include, uh, the acknowledgement of risk that, that they are exposed to hazardous drugs. Um, and then if you've gotten through all of those things, maybe you're in the more of a monitoring or maintenance phase, um, which you should have a designated person who's overseeing your compliance program uh, and have some strategies in place for annual review. Uh, and then maybe you're considering medical surveillance or wipe sampling. Uh, so we'll talk about those. Uh, so the hazardous drug list uh, is based on the NIOSH list. Um, as I mentioned, the, the most current publication is from 2016. Uh, so this is a good place to start. Um, and many folks um, that I've talked to along the way have said, okay, we're starting with the, the NIOSH list and uh, looking to see what drugs they have on their formulary, if they're in the health system, or maybe what drugs they have uh, in stock in their pharmacy. Um, so that's a good place to start. Um, but 2016 was still a few years ago, and my background is in oncology, and uh, I'm sure there's been at least a couple dozen new drugs in oncology that uh, have been approved since 2016. And so um, don't forget about those other drugs that are maybe on your shelf or in your refrigerator um, that you should have a strategy to how to handle them, um, whether they're, they're hazardous or not, um, because NIOSH hasn't quite issued a, any um, clarification on those. But the NIOSH chapter does have a really good um, outline of uh, how to uh, evaluate those, as does the uh, assessment of risk guidelines in uh, 800. Um, and then maybe if you're in a health system or a small, smaller facility, you're not going to have a lot of those drugs in stock, and so maybe patients will be bringing those to your facility, maybe to be filled as a patient's own medication while they're in admitted to the hospital. Uh, so those drugs are still hazardous, even if they're not on your formulary or on your shelf. Um, so you really need to be thinking about um, how those drugs are identified for staff that could be handling them in, in that capacity. Um, and then identifying drugs as hazardous throughout the process as they come in from your wholesaler in the receiving aspect. Um, I know the wholesalers, some of them are being helpful in, um, in identifying hazardous drugs. Some are still working on that. Um, so uh, lots of opportunities there. Uh, and then uh, where drugs are prepared or administered, and then certainly how they're uh, disposed of. There's, there's lots of different um, ways to identify drugs as hazardous. Uh, and this is just one of the, the uh, stickers that I found. Um, so if you're uh, um, still a little daunted by that NIOSH list, this, this might further make, <laughs> make you uh, nervous, but um, this is uh, this is a little breakdown, which um, I appreciate from uh, Dwight DeVera and the RX Transparent group. Um, uh, you may be familiar that the NIOSH hazardous drug list is broken down into three different tables. Uh, table one is the antineoplastic agents, table two, non-antineoplastic, and table three, the reproductive risk group. Um, altogether, that represents um, almost 12,000 NDCs. Um, and in pharmacy speak, that means 12,000 different individual products, dosage form strengths. Uh, and that is totally overwhelming, um, if you think about it. Um, most certainly, you don't have 12,000 of those, all of those in your health system or in your pharmacy. Maybe it's only 1,000, but that's still a lot of drugs to consider for an assessment of risk approach. Um, so that it, it can be a little overwhelming. Um, 
but this helps kind of quantify how, how many drugs we're talking about. Um, so if you're going to do an assessment of risk approach, which um, is, is recommended um, because there are, there are lots of different layers to uh, the, the uh, compliance, I, I kind of like to, you to think about the forest through the trees here, that um, you could think, oh my goodness, this is overwhelming. Um, I don't even want to look at what's going on. Um, but then it's also really easy to focus on just one drug at a time and get overwhelmed uh, at the volume. Like I said, if you have a thousand drugs to review, that's overwhelming. So kind of maybe look at the, the tree in the middle there and not, not focus uh, so much on the specific issue. Um, and here's some different strategies to consider. Um, so these are the, the different uh, required elements of assessment of risk um, per USP 800. You got to think about what type of hazardous drug it is, um, the antineoplastic group of uh, drugs, if they're just being uh, counted or dispensed, are also uh, eligible for assessment of risk. Uh, then from there, you also need to think about dosage form and packaging. Um, then is the is the product being manipulated in any way? Um, that unit dose tablet might be um, easy to handle, but then once you take it out of the, the packaging, is it being cut or crushed uh, for administration to a patient? Um, is there going to be splash risk or aerosolization risk? I um, need to think about that for each dosage form. And then for each of those dosage forms, think about um, the alternative containment strategies and work practices that can help um, people stay safe uh, if, if you're not choosing to adopt the full USP um, or NIOSH guidelines for um, personal protective equipment, storage, et cetera. Um, so as I mentioned, maybe start thinking about some broad strategies like those unit dose tablets that are table two, maybe they could all be treated with a certain level of, of PPE, like a, a single pair of gloves. And then, uh, then you can look at your list and figure out what uh, drugs fit into that category. Um, or as you're doing your assessment, then you know exactly what kind of bucket to put them in. And then it's also really important to think about why we're doing this. Um, it, it's not just to, to check a box, uh, it's, it's really to help Pay, uh, keep people stay safe when they're handling these drugs, and then that really should drive what your processes um, will be to support compliance. So if you're ever feeling overwhelmed, kind of take a step back and think about why are we doing this, um, what other drugs are similar, how can we, how can we kind of group some things together. Um, and these are just a couple of examples of um, assessment of risk uh, documents. Um, sorry that they're uh, overlapping each other, but um, this one here the, is from uh, PPP Mag, and actually it's linked in the reference section in the, the end of the slides. And then this is uh, one is from the, I think, North Carolina Board of Pharmacy. Uh, and I just uh, appreciate how there's two different approaches here, but they, they cover the same kind of information that kind of helps guide you through that thought process that I was talking about. Facilities, we're not going to spend a lot of time on facilities because I'm assuming that most of you um, uh, are on your way with a facilities upgrade plan if you, if you don't already have a, um, a compliant facility um, because, like I mentioned, this is the, the most expensive part of compliance, I think, um, when it comes to air handlers and, uh, and new hoods and things like that. So uh, just a reminder that um, the, the focus is on containing the hazardous drugs and um, that really the most stringent requirements are for antineoplastic drugs or those table one drugs that are requiring manipulation, which is mostly going to be those parenteral dosage forms that you're pre preparing. Um, they do need to be stored separately in an externally ventilated negative pressure room with at least 12 air changes per hour. If you're storing those in your compounding room, then that's, I think, 30 air changes per hour, um, and you'll need to have uh, a dedicated refrigerator for those as well. But all of your other drugs, including table one drugs that are um, only being uh, counted and not further manipulated, uh, can be stored with other inventory if this has been included in your entity policy. Um, so th that goes back to your assessment of risk and thinking about why you're doing what you're doing. And it's not just for convenience sake because it's too expensive to, to build out a, a negative pressure storage room or you don't have the space. Um, but that you've at least thought about what the options are and, and can explain why you're doing what you're doing. And so um, most of the drugs on the NIOSH list is, is probably okay to be in um, a neutral pressure area. Certainly a negative pressure storage area is um, preferred uh, depending on your volume of product and, and space available. 
Uh, some states are really focusing on that in new pharmacy designs, so just be aware of, of that. Um, but neutral pressure is okay if that's uh, described in your assessment of risk and policy. Um, some other containment strategies for receiving and storage is to uh, have a, a designated shelf or section where hazardous drugs are stored. Um, if they are going to be mixed with regular stock, maybe having a, a covered bin as the um, one in the picture on the right there. Um, if you're just doing a dispensing of a bulk uh, hazardous drugs, then maybe having some dedicated equipment like a dedicated counting tray or a prep area. Uh, and then identifying that with some signage, um, I think that'll be a, an easy target for um, regulatory folks to, to look for is how, do, how are your hazardous drugs designated um, and identified. Uh, so for policies and procedures, uh, there's so many different things that need to be covered, um, but the general strategy really is uh, who, what, where, why, and uh, when, and how. Um, just cover all of those, and then I really um, appreciate this graphic um, that you should really think about having policies and procedures for all of these different steps of the medication use process. Um, so think about you know, who's going to be exposed, um, in these different aspects of, of medication handling, um, who's responsible for oversight, um, what are hazardous drugs, where, uh, you know, what PPE is expected at each step of the process, um, what kind of compounding is occurring, is it sterile compounding or non-sterile compounding, um, where are hazardous drugs handled, you know, from the point of receiving, uh, storage, uh, are they being transported from um, a loading dock to a pharmacy to a clinic across the street? Um, thinking about all of that, those aspects. Um, when, uh, you could think about when will the policies uh, be reviewed? Um, your hazardous drug list needs to be reviewed annually. Um, when is additional support needed, such as in a spill response? Um, what, what can staff manage on their own and when do they need to call uh, maybe a spill response team? And then how? How are staff going to be trained on all of these different aspects? And how will compliance be monitored? Um, so I think you know, there's so many different ways that you can approach policies and procedures. Uh, just document, document, document. Uh, if, it, if it's not written down, then it, it isn't going to happen. Uh, and there isn't a standard way that you can hold people accountable to as well. And certainly regulatory uh, agencies are going to be asking to see your policies and procedures um, about all of these different aspects. And then, as I mentioned, once you uh, get to this point, uh, you'll, uh, you're writing all those policies and procedures, you have to train people to uh, what to expect. Uh, and these are the required elements from USP 800. Uh, you need to have a, a list of what your entity-specific hazardous drug list is. So even if you start with the NIOSH hazardous drug list, you have to acknowledge that and say, this is where we're starting from, um, and what the risks are associated with that, whether it's um, you know, organ toxicity or reproductive toxicity or carcinogenicity, um, letting people know what those, their risks are. Um, and then providing an overview of those uh, policies and procedures like we, we just reviewed, uh, which should include how to properly use for personal protective equipment. Um, donning and doffing of garb is uh, easier said than done sometimes. And um, again, getting back to why you're doing it the way you're doing it um, should help with some of those explanations. Um, and then again, proper use of equipment and devices, whether that's um, a biologic safety cabinet or a CACI uh, in the pharmacy or um, a silent night crushing device, something like that. Um, there's still potential for risk to exposure, and so staff need to know what to do in that situation, whether that's an acute exposure like in a um, spill uh, or a more chronic concern. Um, they need to know who to, who to contact with their concerns. Um, you need to have good policies on spill management, and folks, again, need to know who to, who to call for help uh, when that's needed. And then with all of these things, they have to know where to dispose of uh, their hazardous drug uh, packaging, materials, their PPE, and uh, I know that that's a, a question that surveyors will ask as well. Um, tell, me, tell me how you know uh, which, which bucket this goes in. In many places, it's a yellow bucket or a black bucket, or um, some pieces have uh, commingled waste and um, lots of, of different things. So make sure that you um, are clear about that in your training. Um, and then, again, going back to that who, what, where, when, why, um, think about who to include. Um, this is, 
USP 800 to me is is a, a pretty broad um, a broad risk, and it's kind of like uh, bloodborne pathogens or general infection control um, practices that you know almost everybody who is involved in patient care is is at risk. And so maybe there's some broad foundational education you can provide to people. Um, that could cover most of these topics. But there may be areas that need more specific job training um, or competency, such as in the pharmacy where um, they're using uh, you know, different products for preparation and uh, know, knowing how to, to clean and decontaminate their um, chemo hoods. Um, so be thinking about that. Uh, definitely a, a broad base of education is, is important for all staff, uh, in, in my opinion, um, and then others might need some more specifics. Uh, so here we are um, on the road to compliance, so maybe you're, you're getting towards the end of that road. Um, I have my little um, homage to the uh, last VW Beetle coming off the production line there. Um, so if you're, you're getting to that point, congratulations, you've made it through some, some speed bumps and some, some curveballs probably. Uh, so hopefully you've also uh, identified your designated person uh, for oversight of USP 800. Um, this might be a committee as well, and it's just important to really be clear about uh, who is on that committee, what is expected of them, because uh, it's, it's a lot for one uh, person to handle, especially if you add in 795 or 797. Um, and I know many of my pharmacy colleagues are, are a bit uh, overwhelmed. There's, there's so many things that <laughs> we have to manage. Um, it'd be great to have some partnership from nursing and quality and um, environment of care uh, in this oversight group. Uh, and so maybe you've already implemented uh, some uh, training and you've written your policies, so uh, thinking about how you're going to conduct those annual reviews uh, and maybe a more um, uh, staggered way so that you don't have a kind of an overwhelming uh, body of, of work to do in, you know, one month of the year. So be thinking about that. Um, and then uh, I, I have a little under construction uh, sign there because maybe you're still thinking about um, some of the recommended practices such as medical surveillance for staff um, or wipe sampling. Um, if you have implemented either of those programs, good job. Um, that is, is not an easy task. Um, and it also means that you feel really comfortable, uh, hopefully, or confident in the, the practices that you have uh, implemented. And uh, I think we could have a whole other topic of discussion on um, either of these. Uh, and I know ASHP and uh, ONS and OSHA actually have some um, good practice uh, guidelines on um, how to implement both of these programs. So uh, I think we'll have more conversation about this as people get further down this road. All right. Well, as through, through that uh, road to USP 800 compliance, I'm sure that you've come across some challenging scenarios and um, have had to come up with some solutions. Um, just to set the stage for this a little bit more um, also, I, I like to think that the people who write the rules uh, at USP and other places um, are doing this for the, the best of intent. Um, and here is to take care of, you know, pr protect our, our employee group um, from exposure to hazardous drugs. Uh, and that also the intent is hopefully that they, uh, the rules don't get in the way of patient care and they're really for the best patient care. Uh, but I, I think most of us would agree that there's, a, there's some gray areas and there's some challenging situations that um, make it difficult to deliver patient care in the way that we, we have been um, just because we have to follow these rules. So we'll talk about a couple of those. Um, I, I don't have perfect answers and, uh, you know, anything, uh, this is just to offer some, some support and to help you kind of think through some solutions. So methotrexate um, is an antineoplastic agent. It's used for lots of different types of oncologic diagnosis, um, but also for um, rheumatoid arthritis and um, other rheumatoid diseases. And then also for methotrexate, uh, it can be used for ectopic pregnancy. Um, this is typically a pretty low volume um, event, but it is could be seen as an emergent situation and be really nice to have access to this service, uh, this medication 24-7. Um, but because it is an antineoplastic drug, it does uh, technically require full USP 800 compliance, and uh, that would include negative pressure storage, compounding in a uh, containment uh, engineering control uh, hood and room, and uh, a closed system transfer device for administration, if at all possible. Um, there, 
there are plenty of places that, that don't have this capability. Um, they might only have to d dispense a dose for ectopic pregnancy once or twice a year, and uh, they just simply don't have a, a hood or a facility to, um, to, to take care of this. So um, if you don't, then you could certainly build one out uh, with definitely some significant expense. Um, maybe, you know, another option would be that you have a, an oncology clinic that nearby that's part of your health system that um, you could have it compounded there and transported to your um, hospital. Um, then you need to definitely have policies and procedures around that. Um, but the thing about those oncology clinics is they tend to only be open maybe Monday through Friday or during business hours. And so um, when does this patient show up with ectopic pregnancy on you know, Saturday night at 11 p.m.? Uh, and you still need to be thinking about how to take care of a patient at that time. Um, could you refer the patient to uh, an oncology clinic or another facility that has the capabilities? Certainly, and then you're running the risk of the patient not showing up um, or getting, you know, falling through the cracks in some way. Um, so there's, there's not really a, a great solution here that, that really meets all of the needs. Um, and so one option you, you could do is also uh, proceed with your existing capabilities. And, uh, and I think the important part of this is that it's, this isn't one person's decision. This should be a collaborative decision with your um, hospital leadership or your, your organization that includes maybe risk management, um, quality management, certainly the um, OB providers that would uh, be caring for these patients or the ED physicians. Um, and, and, may, and just do a risk assessment. Um, and I think the important thing is that you document that you, you uh, looked at all of the different options and uh, still decided to, to go forward with whatever the, the plan is that you, you decided. Um, and I, I think as long as you are showing that you have thought about it as an organization and are not just ignoring it or, or making a choice based out of convenience, then at least it gives you some grounds to have a conversation with a regulatory group uh, and, and ask them for suggestions. Um, because as I said, we still have to take care of patients. That's the business that we're in. Um, another group of drugs that can, um, has had a little discussion is the GnRH agonists, um, so drugs like Degarelix, Gosarelin, or Luprolide. Um, these are on, also on NIOSH Table 1 in the antineoplastic category. Um, these are a little bit different because they are, come in a fairly self-contained um, package that might require a little bit of manipulation, but not to the same extent as methotrexate. Um, per se. Uh, so some options for this are um, continue to handle it with uh, full USP 100 precautions, which uh, would mean preparing it in the pharmacy and, and getting it to the nursing unit for administration in a pretty quick timeline, um, which can be challenging. Uh, I know most, most places are just um, the nurses are preparing this at the, the bedside or their chair side right now. Um, but there is also the ability to um, complete an assessment of risk on uh, this class of drugs uh, because uh, they are they require very little manipulation. And they're actually, uh, USP did address this in their FAQs. You can look at um, FAQ number 21. Um, so if you are gonna do an assessment of risk on um, these type of drugs, just make sure that you think about really the details of that dosage form, the packaging, how the product's manipulated, who's doing that, and then, um, again, what alternative containment strategies and work practices uh, you're going to employ to keep uh, staff safe. So that might be um, additional PPE, such as double gloves, a gown, or a face shield. Um, I'm not sure if closed system transfer devices are gonna be as uh, feasible with this dosage form, but um, you could give it a try. Uh, and then there uh, are a couple of formulations that are uh, don't require reconstitution. They're already, um, ready to use, and so that might be less manipulation um, to consider that product. All right, um, BCG, I'll just go over um, pretty quickly. Um, BCG is an, also on the antineoplastic table. Uh, it's a vaccine, but it's, it's used for bladder cancer in urology offices. Um, the, the loophole, there might be a loophole uh, that uh, the AUA, um, or American Urological Association, is, is trying to uh, uh, shine a light on, I think, is that um, USP now says that products that are only reconstituted or only, follow, are only manipulated following the manufacturer's instructions for use, 
uh, may not be subject to the full 797-800 standards. Um, so I, I don't think that's the best way to go. I still think it's best practice in, for safety, for, for worker safety, um, to prepare BCG in um, a, a full negative pressure suite. Um, but that, again, may not be feasible. So here's some different things to consider, um, maybe consolidating services to um, an area that has, does have a compliant pharmacy. Um, again, if you're transporting from maybe a, a clinic pharmacy to um, you know, another clinic down the street, make sure you have some good policies and procedures around safe transport. Um, certainly a, an option is always to stop offering that service, but again, that's kind of uh, getting in the way of patient care. Um, and then you can, can look at the statement by AUA and, um, and consider enforcement. Um, if, you're, if your clinics are, uh, urology clinics are hospital-based clinics, then they are subject to joint commission and you should be ready to uh, explain, explain your processes for compliance. And then last but not least, um, in, in terms of, of uh, challenging scenarios, I'm sure there are many others that, um, that have come up. Uh, but uh, maybe you only have a few hazardous drugs on your, your formulary or in stock, and maybe they're, they're only um, bulk bottles or unit doses, uh, so you, you just don't have a whole lot and you don't have the funding or space to build out a whole negative pressure storage area. Um, so some things to consider in this situation, um, do that assessment of risk and really look at each drug and dosage form. Um, maybe there's some non-formulary substitutions you could make that are, are, are some formulary substitutions that are not hazardous, excuse me. Um, not many opportunities for that, but something to consider. Uh, again, identify if there's any unit dose products available. Um, there are some repackaging vendors that will uh, provide you with unit dose products, um, and Chris is going to talk about those in his section. Um, and then when you, you are uh, dispensing those products, make sure that you have some dedicated um, uh, accounting trays, equipment, and good SOPs, uh, and try and contain them. So those would be your alternate containment strategies and work practices. All right, a few, few curves and bumps along the way. Um, so Premier is here to support you in, in um, getting ready for compliance for USP 800. And um, one of the sites I want to highlight is our um, Premier Safety Institute, uh, which has a whole uh, page on hazardous drugs in healthcare settings. Um, it includes links to um, some of those resources uh, that I mentioned, including the NIOSH page, uh, CDC, all the USP documents, as well as some of our Premier tools. Um, and so uh, please check that out as a, a resource. Uh, and now I'm going to hand it over to uh, my good friend, Chris Jones, who uh, is our Director of Pharmacy Automation and Technology, and uh, he's my go-to person for, for finding out what do we have in terms of supplies and contracted vendors that meet the USP standards. Thanks, Annie, and uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I'm going to quickly go through some of the things that we currently have on uh, the GPO contract with Premier. Uh, because we know that you're going to need these types of elements to uh, manage to come in line with USP 800. Um, on this slide you see we do have suppliers that can uh, provide you with clean room uh, personal protective equipment as well as the needed cleaning supplies and other consumables. Uh, I did want to highlight that S2S Global, which is a premier subsidiary, does make some of the PPE uh, that, that uh, our members use. We also have a couple of other suppliers that uh, offer these things. Some of these things, of course, would um, apply to 795 and 797 as well, but I wanted to make sure we highlighted things such as the chemo spill kits, um, any kind of wipes that you would new use, uh, the um, various body coverings such as the gloves, the garbs, the mask, et cetera, and anything you would use in the process of decontamination and, and cleaning um, would certainly be important not only to USP 800 but 797 as well. Um, we mentioned primary engineering controls. Of course, for those things you're going to have to do that with, we do have those on contract, both with Baker and with New Air, uh, whether that's a containment ventilation enclosure for handling raw powders or whether that is uh, a, a true uh, primary engineering control that you're going to use in a clean room setting to handle hazardous injectables and others. Uh, the key considerations there are um, obviously this is a significant capital expense, so hopefully if you're going through those now, you've already uh, got those budgets in. 
um, as well as uh, looking on the Premier website, you can see what kind of service guarantees and warranties are out there for you and various size con and uh, configurations as well as the accessories that go along with these uh, pieces of equipment. Um, again, we, we uh, have those at your disposal as well as uh, incubators and things like that that you would need in, in the day-to-day -day operation of a clean room. Speaking of clean room, hopefully you, you are in this stage already, uh, but if not, if you do find that your current clean room needs a, a refresh to come up to the standards, we offer uh, contracted services through a couple of providers that can come in and do a gap analysis as well as the architectural work to either retrofit a current clean room or to build a clean room from scratch to get you to whatever that uh, level might be, uh, as the picture on the top uh, right shows, uh, perhaps maybe you need a change in your air handler to come up to code or whatever uh, they need, these folks can do that with a turnkey solution. And then, uh, as is mentioned, anywhere that control, uh, the um, closed system transfer devices can be used, they should be used, so we do have various uh, closed system transfer devices on uh, on contract, I think I would point out there that uh, it, it can be a bit of a stretch for nursing because as you stop and think about it, um, they're not as used to using these as probably pharmacy, but if uh, the administration allows for uh, a CSTD, then it should be used according to the new 800 guidelines. So uh, just to be aware that we do have those from various manufacturers. Um, where indicated, if you have a high volume of um, USP 800 compounding, we do have robotic systems that can be placed into your clean room uh, from OmniCell and also from uh, our Exium uh, that automates the process using robotic arms and, and other equipment. Uh, and then those are ventilated, as you can see there in the picture, so that they do meet the requirements for USP 800. Uh, those obviously aren't cheap and they have to be budgeted for, but where uh, they make sense, they do, uh, they are available through the Premier uh, contract. For those of you, whether you're doing high volume or low volume, I think it makes sense to look at what some of your options are around repackaging of oral hazardous drugs, and we do have SafeCore on contract, and they do provide that both from a 795 and an 800 requirement. Uh, also on their webpage, they have a nice little uh, repackaging compliance uh, uh, website there that can tell you the seven keys to standards as it relates to repackaging. If you decide to do your own, it's a great little reference guide, but they are on contract to allow you to uh, send your medications to them and have those repackaged for them to help you hit your 800 compliance. One of the things that has recently come up is the EPA has changed their guidelines as it relates to disposal. Um, and these go into effect uh, later next month for most states. Uh, the intent is to, again, protect the environment. That makes sense. And uh, what it's going to change is how healthcare systems accumulate uh, their hazardous waste and how they're sent backwards, whether that's through a reverse distributor or for waste destruction. Um, the intent is to stop uh, washing things in the traditional sink. Uh, certainly no longer putting anything hazardous in, in the sewer system through, through a toilet or a drain. Um, it differentiates what's a reverse logistics versus a reverse distributor. We do have uh, four different reverse distributors on contract with Premier. All of those do handle um, hazardous drugs. Essentially what the EPA standard is going to guide you towards is, is the drug uh, returnable for credit or not? And is it something that, and, and if you think about that, that, that should be pretty obvious if it's not broken, if it's not a year past its expiry date, et cetera, um, or is it not? And they're also going to allow you to have an area where you can house the things that you've inventoried uh, for, for destruction or for return, whatever the case might be, as long as you designate that area as hazardous drugs and follow all the USP 800 compliance around packaging it, labeling it, storing it all in one spot, uh, you meet the guidelines. And uh, those are available at the EPA requirement uh, website uh, if, if you want to take a look at that. Um, again, the biggest thing is you need to follow the same recipe that you're following for USP 800 as it relates to notification training, policy and procedure, record keeping, et cetera.
So we know you're getting ready. We're here to support you in that. So you can reach out to Annie. You can reach out to myself and others for any kind of advice. You can certainly use the various links that we've covered today, such as Premier Safety Institute, uh, the Premier website, et cetera. Uh, reaching out to Annie. She is obviously our guru as it relates to USP 800. I can help you with things around the uh, what we have on contract. Um, we have the consulting services. Annie and her team can come out and do everything from a mock survey to a USP 800 gap analysis. And then Annie's already mentioned we have various places, whether it's on the member pharmacy member uh, support page, whether it's on the Patient Safety Institute, whether it's on Premier Inc., uh, where you can pull down the USP checklist, both 795, uh, 797, and actually 800. So I wanted to make sure we left plenty of time for uh, Q&A, so we're going to pause now and have the operator uh, assist us with uh, questions. There, here's uh, another additional list of uh, resources and, and links that you can use, but I'm going to turn it back over to the operator so that we can manage the question and answer session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to register for a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. All right. And Once as a again, reminder, you can also type in your questions into the chat box. Okay. So, thank you, Annie and Chris. We have several questions that have already come in via the chat box, and I have to admit that even though I am a pharmacist, it's been a while since I practiced. So, some of this seems like a foreign language to me right now, but um, let's go ahead and get started with some of these. <laughs> so um, the first question is related to nurse administration of NIOSH 2 and 3 oral solutions or IVs. The question is, do they really need full garb to give spironolactone suspension, for example? Do we have to prepare IV NIOSH 2 and 3s in negative pressure rooms with our chemo, as that seems like it would increase exposure to NIOSH 1 drugs? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, and I, I can tell that that means you're really thinking about um, the, the different steps involved in medication process, um, both in preparation and administration. Um, for your Table 2 and Table 3 drugs, uh, that is really based on your assessment of risk um, about what PPE would be required uh, for administration of those drugs. And I think that's where it's really important to partner with nursing colleagues that um, this, this shouldn't be a, a thing that pharmacy says this is what you have to do, um, but that, that nurses really need to um, have a good understanding of, of the processes and the risks as well. Um, uh, so kind of going back to that assessment of risk standard, what are the alternate containment practices uh, and uh, work practices that you want to implement? Um, I have seen lots of different uh, range of things from just a single pair of gloves to a double pair of gloves to uh, gloves and gowns. Uh, so that's really based on what your uh, organization is comfortable with. That's great. Um, so there's some questions regarding um, the type of gloves that can be used for handling, cleaning, and administration. Are there any limitations on what can and cannot be used? So for example, so there are some specific questions as they relate to specific mm -hmm. um, items. Yeah, uh, I see those in the chat box there. So, so USP 800 um, does specify that um, gloves for uh, uh, handling hazardous drugs, and you can define a little bit what that means, but I think the expectation is at all steps of the process are tested to the ASTM D6978 standard, and uh, that should be fairly apparent either on the box of the gloves themselves, or you can check with the vendor um, or your supply chain folks can help validate that. Um, one point I want to make about gloves is that um, your, your universal exam glove um, that's out there for everybody may be compliant if it meets that D6978 standard, uh, but where uh, some challenges can come up is if there's a product substitution because uh, a product you know, is suddenly um, not available. Um, so, so be paying attention to that and make sure to include your supply chain folks in their awareness. Um, also look at other places like in the OR if you're doing any um, chemo, um, uh, like HIPEC or um, chemoembolization in the IR suite, and then certainly our pharmacy preparation areas have sterile gloves that also need to be um, meet that testing standard. Okay. 
you. And I'll pause for a second and see um, if there are any questions on the line operator. We do. Our first question is from the line of Nicole Blackwelder. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you, and a wonderful presentation today. Uh, I wanted to ask you, go, pinging on to the um, administration piece and the assessment of risk, you know, every hospital in the country is going to be doing their own assessment of risk, and I'm just mm -hmm. anticipating that uh, a surveyor comes in and goes to our L&D unit and sees a nurse hanging oxytocin without looking like she's preparing to, uh, for Ebola, and you end up in that <laughs> is-to-is-not discussion with a, a surveyor. Uh, you know, what, what in that assessment of risk if we just, you know, what, what's protecting us in that assessment of risk from a surveyor saying, well, no, I disagree with you? How, how are people handling mm -hmm. that? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's kind of what, what we're all waiting um, to find out with bated breath, how the surveyors are going to be trained and how they're going to inspect against this. Um, and I think oxytocin is a great example. Kind of on the other end of, you know, methotrexate for ectopic pregnancy, it's, it's clear that it's this type of drug and it should be handled this way. Um, oxytocin is on the table three and only a reproductive risk uh, drug. And I, I think what, what um, is gonna help in that situation is that um, you have some kind of assessment of risk document or form and it shows uh, the, uh, what you assessed as a team. Um, you also have an assessment of risk policy that says this is the process that we go through to assess risk of drugs and this is what we're doing. This is uh, maybe who was involved in making this decision. And um, uh, I, I, I think if your team is confident in why you made that decision and not just, well, that's what my pharmacist told me or uh, we think this is a dumb rule, you know, that, that, that's never a good <laughs> explanation to a surveyor. So, um, and, and be able to say, this is the, the precautions we feel are safe. Uh, and so, for example, our standard exam glove we know is tested to this standard and uh, there's very little risk of splashing or spill because it's a pre-mixed bag that already comes to us and we've thought about all of those things and this is what we're comfortable with. Thank you. I think it's going to have to be a conversation. Operator, are there any other questions on the line? We have no further questions at this time, ma'am. Okay, great. Um, so, Annie, there is a question as it relates to cyclosporin and specifically the restasis eye drops. Any recommendations on how that should be handled? Mm, uh, that is tricky. I think, again, you'll have to think about um, what is the real exposure risk. That, that's almost its own um, contained uh, product and you know, in my opinion, it'd be very little risk for splashing or spilling because you'd have to like practically step on it to really um, get much exposure to that. Um, you know, certainly as a, a pharmacist going through all this and, and um, thinking more about what we do in the pharmacy, it's good to talk, you know, go out and talk to your, your nursing and provider colleagues that are actually administering these products, see what they're doing. Um, I had kind of assumed that people wore gloves all the time. Um, and that was a, a false assumption. <laughs> um, and you'd think that when people are putting eye drops in that they would maybe already be wearing gloves, or, but maybe they've only done, um, you know, hand hygiene. Uh, so just talking about that and talking through that. Um, and then really thinking about what is the risk of exposure in that particular situation and talking to the people that actually are performing that uh, administration. Okay. And then the last question that we have time for relates to facilities that may be smaller or may have policies in place that permit patients to bring in their own drugs or their mm -hmm. own specialty meds, for example. What, um, how should facilities handle that circumstance where the drug that they're bringing in may be a hazardous medication? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure that that is going to happen, whether you're a small facility or even a large facility. Um, that's going to happen. So you need to be thinking about it. Um, um, I'm assuming that you have some kind of process that if patients are bringing in their own medication that it's being verified by a pharmacist or a nurse in some way before it's actually administered to the patient. And so maybe there's some training or um, and policy written around that uh, verification process. Uh, and maybe you add a question into that as, is this a hazardous drug? You know, consult the NIOSH list at least at that point. Um, 
for those of you with um, maybe a little bit more robust EMR systems, um, that's something to think about too, that uh, how you, you flag and identify those drugs as hazardous in your EMR. Um, maybe you're focusing on those that are formulary because those are the ones that are easier to control. But if you know, the, the doc writes that prescription or that order for patient to continue their um, uh, uh, Zolota, for example, that, uh, that's an oral um, oncolytic that they're going to bring in from home, um, then there's still going to be an order for that in the, in the chart, and maybe you have some hazardous drug language even on those drugs that you don't stock. I know that's an extra layer of um, maintenance and um, effort, but uh, it's something I think we need to think about um, Otherwise, I mean, the other approach you could take is that you, you use universal precautions for all of patient-owned meds because, let's be honest, there's other than hazardous agents, there's a lot of other things out there in the home and in the, in the field that we're, we may not know about. So um, that might be a good approach as well. Okay. Well, that brings us to the top of the hour. I'd like to take a moment to thank both Chris and Annie for their time today and their ongoing expertise. Their contact information is available in the slide deck. We also have several additional resources available for you that are highlighted here. And at the end of today's webinar, when you go to exit, there will be a few questions that we hope you take a few seconds to help us answer so we can better understand how we can help you prepare for December 1st. So with that, I'd like to end today's um, webinar and thank everybody for their time. We hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you all.